all that. I just want to go over the agenda very quickly uh, because we're trying to finish this program uh, by 9.50, inshallah, and there will be a unit session after that and a refreshment after that. So, uh, yeah. so our main speaker today is Kalar Sadat. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, the case so, yeah. for street dial. Bye. Before that, we'll have a quick presentation by Brother Zishan. He's going to talk about the legacy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the Dawah work. Then we have Brother Nabi, who's going to talk about the importance of Dawah. <coughs> and then Brother Sadat will talk about the street Dawah specifically. Uh, there will be a QA session, QA session after the presentation. And after uh, when it's done, there will be a refreshment provider. And then we'll be heading to Shepherd at 10 15, inshallah. I just want to also give a quick introduction of our brothers who are going to be present. Uh, Brother Nishan, he's the co-founding member of the organization and public discussion forum. Uh, the Institute of Hydrogen, he performs and promotes open dialogue and discussion between the public speakers of all backgrounds and the public at large. Uh, Nishan is also an active member of the Toronto Basic Street Dawa Group and Dawa Canada. Brother Naveed, uh, he is a financial analyst by profession. He moved to Canada just a year ago. He volunteers with Dawa Canada and IER in Canada. I love this local Muslim for the Islamic Center. Brother Salat Anwar, who is the main speaker today, he was born in Toronto. He studied Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Toronto and is a member of Muslim Debate Initiative and Student Dawa Toronto. So, inshallah, without further ado, we are going to start our program. Um, and like this program is jointly organized by ICNA, by Dawa Canada, and by IUA. So if you have any question, please uh, hold off your question at the session. You can ask the question and So I'll ask your Brother Naveed, uh, Brother Zishan, to start the program. Yeah. <coughs> um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good? So without further ado, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, we, uh, most of us know that the, uh, the Islamic system uh, emerged uh, through the leadership, by the leadership, uh, uh, through our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which produced the, the best system for humanity, a system that was unrivaled on this planet. It was a system that brought us the best healthcare system for humanity. Actually, it was, uh, it was actually in the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Masjid in Medina that held the first free hospital in its courtyard. Also later on, in the early 700s, under the Islamic system, uh, the, the Islamic system produced uh, one of the most robust healthcare systems, which uh, had patients, which received patients from uh, for free uh, from all backgrounds, all religions, all backgrounds. Also, uh, not only that, but uh, uh, patients were uh, when the patients were discharged, were given money when they were discharged from these hospitals. The Islamic system provided us the best economic system, right? Based on the redistribution of wealth, not based on the interest debt based system that we and the rest of humanity are subject to, where eight people own as much wealth as the 3.6 billion people on this planet, the poorest people on this planet. Also, in our country, two people have as much wealth as the 30% poorest in this country. It is the Islamic system that played as a liberator to both Muslims and non-Muslims. And just to highlight a few examples, uh, uh, starting from the Muslims going to Spain to save the Unitarian Christians from oppression uh, and persecution, to, uh, to that episode uh, that we all know that one of our leaders from history, uh, Al Muqassam, had uh, saved one woman, went into our Ummah's army to save that one woman who was captured by an opposing party. And also, as this picture uh, depicts, uh, the Usmani Khalafa uh, played as a, a savior for people, Muslim, uh, Jews and Muslims who were, uh, who were running away from persecution. Uh, in that, it was a happening uh, from the Spanish Inquisition. Now, I just want to mention uh, something here. Uh, this, uh, this quote is by a non-Muslim, a former CEO of HP. Uh, and a former uh, uh, American uh, politician. Uh, the, who the person is doesn't validate the quote, but the quote itself is uh, it's very uh, it's a very important quote which I have to share with you. So the quote goes as this: um, There was once a civilization that was 
the greatest in the world. It was able to create a continental superstate that stretched from ocean to ocean and from northern climes to tropics and deserts. Within its dominion lived hundreds of millions of people of different creeds and ethnic origins. Its military protection allowed a degree of peace and prosperity that had never been known. The reach of this civilization's commerce extended from Latin America to China and everywhere in between. While modern Western civilization shares many of these traits, the civilization I'm talking about was the Islamic world from the year 800 to 1600, which included the Ottoman Empire and the courts of Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, and enlightened rulers like Suleiman the Magnificent. Now, you may be asking yourself, what in the world does this have to do with Dawah? Well, if it wasn't for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions doing Dawah, actively conveying the message of Islam, actively inviting people to Islam, then the Islamic system would not have emerged. With that, I pass it on to our next speaker, uh, Brother Naveed Ahmed, who will talk about the importance of Dawah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, the slides that I'm, uh, that I'm going to take care of are the ones uh, related to what is the importance of Dawah. So, what is the importance of Dawah? Uh, how many people over here know what Dawah is? Alright. What, young man, what does it mean? Dawah means like to call people. To call people to Islam. Okay. Okay, mashallah. Okay, mashallah. To call people to Islam. Is there any other meaning for Dawah? Invitation. All right. So we have covered both the meanings of Dawah. Basically, Dawah has uh, a linguistic meaning and a Sharia meaning. But in the linguistic sense, it means to call. Anyone likes to just to call. For example, I'm pretty sure most of the people are here from the Indian Pakistani background. So when we actually call someone for biryani at a place, what's it called? Calling for Dawah, which is basically Dawah. But from a Sharia perspective, the word uh, the, it means to call towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, to call towards the Oneness of Allah, to call towards Islam. So that is the Sharia meaning of Dawah. One quick question: uh, who, who do you think? Uh, what, what is the first person that comes to your mind who is the best in Dawah from a linguistic pers uh, perspective? Prophet Muhammad. So I'll repeat your question: Who do you think is the best in Dawah from a linguistic perspective? Maybe today. I mean, like whatever. Today, Facebook. Who? Facebook. Facebook. Okay, Facebook. Oh, that's a good, uh, good one. Anyone else, sisters? No one. It is the Shaitan, because he is constantly calling us, everyone around him, towards his, uh, towards evil. Constantly, diligently, doing it for thousands of years, non-stop, actively, passionately. So he's doing it from a linguistic perspective, not from a Sharia, uh, from a uh, perspective of Sharia. So we've already discussed what it means. Uh, the word Dawah has and its roots and its different forms have appeared in the Quran more than 100 times. All right, in in different contexts. Okay, uh, we'll not go delve into that. I just want to show that uh, what uh, how the uh, what is the occurrence of. Uh, the word Dawah in, in, in the Quran, and of course it has appeared in the Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and many other uh, the books uh, 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 that are present. All right. So what I'm going to do is my case. The thing I'm trying to sell you, the idea that I'm trying to sell you guys is, brother, why don't you come over here? Join us. Well, like at least the younger guys. All right. Okay. So um, so I'm going to uh, put forward three main ideas. One is. Yeah, give a pitch. You know what a pitch is to sell an idea? It's through the Quran and the Sunnah. The second is through a logical approach, and the third one is through an emotional approach. Because we all love emotional approaches, so we keep it in the end. And since the Quran and the Sunnah is the most important thing that we can speak about, we speak out about it first, alright? So, from the Quran and the Sunnah perspective, I'm going to put forward six points. I'm, I'm making six claims over here, inshallah, inshallah, Allah. and I'm going to provide evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah from, from there. The first one is, those who give da'wah are from the best of people. Okay, that's my first name. Second name, those who give da'wah are the best in speech. Okay, third one, it's a means of success. Fourth, command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fifth one is the rewards, the immense, the immense rewards associated with da'wah. And the sixth name I'm making is, it's a shield from the wrath of Allah, or it includes you amongst the mentioned ones. So I'm going to provide evidence from the Quran and from the Sunnah, inshallah. 
uh, about each and every one of these six things. Yeah? So the first one is those who give power are from the best of people. This is Surah Ali Amran, verse 110. Allah will let you again. Kuntum Khayyamun at the Oklejat in Das, that Muruna will now rufi what an Hauna al Murkir, but to Minuna will learn. The translation is your best nation produce as an example for mankind. You enjoy what is right and forbid what is evil. So, what is the best form of do, uh, calling, uh, the best form of enjoining what is right? What is the best form of that? What is the best thing that you can call people towards? Towards Islam. Islam. What else? Young man, you should be sitting in the front. You are my like, main guy over here. What did you say? With Islam. Anyone else? All right. So, yeah, you. To goodness. To? To goodness. To goodness. Okay, mashallah. Jazakallah khair. So, all of the answers are correct. But the best thing uh, to walk towards is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To walk towards the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the best thing that person can enjoy. Amongst all the best things are the good things are in the world. Okay? So, a person who actually gives dawah, walks towards Allah, stops people from uh, uh, doing uh, evil deeds is basically doing dawah. So that is my first claim. My second claim is those who give dawah are the best in speech. I'm sorry I'm speaking very fast. Do you understand what I'm saying? Everyone understand? Is there anyone who does not understand what I'm saying? Can you hear me at the back? Look. So I have done this and I have a lot of flights. So and, and I speak very fast normally, so it works for me. Okay. So this is uh, and this is one of from one of the most beautiful surah according to me. I mean like I love this surah, this surah Muslim. Uh, those who give dawah are the best in speech. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Now subhanAllah, if you look at the procession of this ayah, and who is better in speech than one who calls towards Allah and does righteousness and says, and he's proud to say that I'm indeed one of the Muslims. Alright? Now think of it this way. You know, if the if the president of or is the prime minister over here, yeah, if the prime minister of uh, Canada comes and says, "This person is one of the best people I know," that person that person is so honored. This is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He is the King of Kings, and he is saying he is pointing out towards people and calling them they, the, the speech that they that comes out of their mouth is the best of speeches. Who would not want to be one of these honored ones? Is there anyone over here who does not want to be one of these honored ones? What about you? You want to be one of them, right? Me too. Me too. All right. So the third one is it's a means to success. Everyone probably over here, no matter how young he is, yeah, at this, at this, at this age, except that one, pretty, pretty young, knows this, uh, this, this surah, which is surah al-As, okay? Uh, I asked that he has only one, two, three, three, one of the shortest uh, surahs of the Quran. So we already know what, uh, what it means. Uh, by time, indeed, mankind is in loss, except for, uh, uh, for people who have four traits. Four traits, yeah? The first one is those who believe, of course. Number two, who do righteous deeds. Number three, advise each other. Tawasaw, tawasaw, which is wasiyah, comes from uh, wasiyah, which means to advise strongly towards the truth and advise each other, uh, each other uh, to patience. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out these people who are doing da'wah, who are uh, calling, advising each other to the truth, calling people towards the haq. And what is the best of haq? The truth, what is the best of truth? That there is only one Allah and advise each other towards patience. So that is my proof for uh, the means to success. Is everyone following me, to, following me till now? Anyone? Who is? No? Okay. So, uh, this is uh, the, it's a command from Allah. So the ayah is, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wa mawqidha bil hasana wa jadil hum bil ladhi hiya ahsan which means invite to the way of your Lord with wisdom and good instruction and argue with them in a way that is better, but that is best. Now, if you look at the first word over here, that's Udru. Uh, are there any people over here who have studied Arabic grammar? Okay, so what is the, the zero of Udru? It's an Amr. And Amr is a hukum. It's a hukum from Allah SWT. Do this. Alright? Pull. Say. Udru. Do this. It's not like, it's, it's not like, like a, like a, um, uh, one of the uh, a normal friend, it's a friend Amr, Amr, which means that it's a hukum from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why I say that it's from the, uh, it's a command from Allah that a person should do da'wah. And of course the word uh, Udu has also come from, it's a, it's a good word of da'wah, which is basically invite. 
the rewards are immense. So there's a hadith uh, from Sahih Muslim uh, in which the Prophet peace be upon him said that whoever invites or guides to a, uh, to a good deed will get a reward similar to the one who performs it. There's another section to it as well, by the way, which says that so you invite someone to do something good, all right, and everything that he does will be added to you ex uh, without uh, any uh, deficiency in his uh, hasana, in his point. So, you know, how many of you have actually heard of uh, so what is it called? The, the network marketing? Anyone? But network marketing, you know what that is? What is it? You have to look to be loud. Pyramid schemes. Pyramid schemes, all right. Uh, that's a notorious way of putting it, bonsai schemes, pyramid schemes. The idea is that the person on the top that you see over there, is the one who sells an idea to the, those below him. Those sell the idea to someone else. It's an idea, it's a product. So what happens is basically, uh, uh, if that the first person sells something for, to the other person for $2, the same person sells other products for two dollars. The first person actually gets one dollar out of it, so he's getting some benefit out of it. Right? Subhanallah. Uh, this is Dawa is basically the best network marketing scheme ever, ever. Because what it does is it does not reduce uh, any of the benefits of those people underneath it, and all the benefits in total are going to the person that profits. So everyone is a winner in this situation. Does anyone, everyone understand this? So A, actually, for example, uh, through him, two people come to Islam and they become scholars. So these two people will get the benefits of being a scholar, which is like uh, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala scale, whatever he puts over there. And the one at the top is also getting benefiting from both of these skills. All right? How much time do I have? Who's my timekeeper? My timekeeper is not here. All right. I have four minutes. Okay. Just go ahead. All right. All right, so people, uh, okay, the da'wah will shield the people from the wrath of Allah and the, or it will include them amongst the mentioned ones. Does everyone know the story of the, 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 the Sabbath breakers? No? There was a small tribe of uh, the, uh, of Bani Israel that was near, near, uh, near the sea, and they used to fish over there, and they were told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to fish on Saturdays as a test to them. But what they did was, uh, they found a hila, uh, a shortcut, or a twisted way of actually going around it. They did not fish on Sundays, but what they did on Friday nights, or Fridays was that they made a, some some bowls or something, some duck something, or the banks, in which fish will get caught, and then they will come back on Sunday and catch those fishes. So there were three groups of people amongst those, uh, amongst the Bani The first group of people were the ones who were doing this act, who were trying to place mud with Allah Okay? The second group of people were the ones who were admonishing them, and telling them, oh, you're doing something wrong, stop doing it. All right, and of course, they, when they were stopping them from doing it, also, and they were not doing it themselves. There were third group of people who were not stopping them, the first group, but they were also not uh, going and fishing as well. So, and then the Adab of Allah Taala came, and they were made to apes. Be apes despised. This is the eye of uh, in, the, in the Quran. It has been mentioned at least in two places. So what happens, uh, there's a difference of opinion between the ulama, uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one group of ulama say, okay, I need to move forward, is that the Arab came uh, on the remaining two, one, the, the ones who did the wrong, something wrong, and the ones who did not stop them. And the other group says that no, they were, three, they were not punished, the ones who did not do anything, and did not, uh, either they uh, fished, neither did they stop the people, they were not um, uh, punished, but then they were also not mentioned the Quran as well. Logical argument. So the logical argument has two points. The first one is if you're, then this is a very famous thing. I think it's from attributed to Abdul Hamid. I could be wrong, uh, but it makes sense. If you're not giving dawa, then you are receiving dawa. Every single moment in time that you're outside, that you're speaking to people, someone is giving you dawa, calling you towards one thing or another. And if it's not someone, then it's your harin, your shaitan that's associated with you. So if you're not giving dawa, then you are receiving dawa, you're accepting it also. The second one is the second people are going to. So these people, there's a group of people that Allah has decided that they're going to be saved. Allah has chosen those people already. So it's like, you know, the, uh, uh, the Dawah is like, uh, as we say in Urdu, I'm, I'm sorry uh, for people who have been that only kana ke shahidu manaf kana, which actually means that you just cut a finger and you claim yourself to be a shaheed. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, all you need to do is that it's going to happen anyways. Why don't we just get involved in the process and maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them through you. They're going to be getting anyways, and you get the benefits out of it. 
So that's the logical argument that I'm uh, uh, putting towards you. Uh, the Prophet peace upon him said that Islam will reach each and every house, and this is the hadith from, uh, uh, from Ahmed. My third argument is, of course, the uh, the, uh, the emotional argument, which is from the strongest argument, not the strongest, after the Quran of Sunnah, which is what people like to be uh, to, to get emotional, which is what, um, and people like stories. So, giving dawah is about being a human being. All right. Once you're giving dawah, you actually understand the. Uh, let me let me give you a, a short story. Uh, do you know what a maze, maze, a maze is? A labyrinth? No? Yeah, you know Does everyone know what a maze is? Yes. Yeah? So you have and you enter one point and then you have to go through this and that and that's like there's only one exit out. So I, I want to put a story uh, to you guys, alright? And the story is there's a person and he is invited to enter a maze as a, as a game. He goes with his family, he goes with his friends, he makes his own team and goes over there. And when he enters it, he's in the middle of it, he's trying to find his way around, and then suddenly the maze gets, uh, uh, catches fire. There's fire everywhere, there's smoke everywhere, people, people are popping, people are uh, falling down, and there is fear and there is trouble all across him. And suddenly when he's falling down, you see there's a piece, piece of paper on the ground which with a map on it. It tells him exactly how to go through the maze and get out. He picks up the map, looks at it once uh, 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 across, uh, goes, uh, finds his way around, and then uses a map and answers. All his family, all his friends stayed and remained behind and they kept and, and like they kept. Of course, this fire on, they got to get burned and they die. What do you think about this person? Do you think he's a very humane person? He was a very nice person? Does anyone who here think that he was he did something right? No? You think he did something right? No, of course. He did something horrible. He said something cruel. He said something in in your way, inhumane. We are exactly the same people. Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the right and uh, the knowledge. He has given us the, uh, he has guided us. And if it is, if, uh, we know the map, we have given the map, and if you're not sharing it to other people, this is what's going to happen to them. So keep that in mind. These are the people that you've known your entire life, all right? So, um, but I just want to uh, end with this thing. What do you think about this person? Any ideas? What do you think about it? The first thing that comes to your mind. Something more dangerous, all right? All right, what else? He's, very, he's not wearing a stomach. He's not wearing a topi? <laughs> no, he's not wearing a stomach. He's not wearing, doing something stomach. Yeah. Okay, all right, excellent. Yeah? He's probably, like, looks like a pump, yeah? You're afraid, your favorite probably, I don't know what he is. People who uh, live on him. Someone somewhere, he, this is, give him down. This is what he was before, and this is what he is after. Someone somewhere, target a seat. Dawah is for everyone, everyone deserves to hear the message of Islam. His video is online, you can have a look. His whole body is covered with tattoos. And someone he was gave, gave him Dawah and that's how he became Muslim. And you can find his video easily. If you search for, it's, it's a, he's a British guy. Uh, he accepted Islam when I saw the video around seven days before that. So, so uh, that's pretty much from my side. Uh, I didn't like brother Sadat to come over here. And sorry, I, I think I took a lot of your time. Just one of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the right. Yeah. Um, Bismillah, So, just a reminder uh, to the brothers and sisters that that uh, I'm not talking about how to do dawah. So I'm not talking about how to do street dawah. I'm making the case for street dawah. In other words, why street dawah? What are the reasons we should consider doing street dawah uh, and, and not be, uh, be worried about it or shy about it? So I'm going to jump right into it. And mashallah, Brother Naveen did a very good job of setting the, uh, the general groundwork for, for why we should do dawah in general. But this is specifically why street dawah. Uh, so reason uh, number one uh, is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in which he said, "This is in Sahih Bukhari." He said, "Badlihu anni walau ayat," which means uh, convey from me or transit, uh, tra uh, transmit from me, even if it's a single ayat. So share, even if it's one uh, teaching, one verse of the Quran, share it with with other people. So. When you're doing street dawah, in other words, when you're doing dawah on the street, you have a table, you're getting on books, you're going to have opportunities to talk to people, and you're going to have an opportunity to fulfill this uh, advice, to fulfill this command.
to convey uh, the ayat of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this should be reason enough. Why not? Why not do street that way? You're gonna have an opportunity to talk to non-Muslims. And during the course of those conversations, of course, you're gonna share some of the teachings of the Quran, some of the teachings of the Sunnah. And that should be reason enough really for us to want to do street dawah, to want to participate in it. Reason number two. Wallahi la ayyahdi Allahu bika rajulan khayrul laka min ayyakuna laka humrul a'a hum humrul a'a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said by Allah that Allah guides a person through you is better for you than a herd of expensive red camels and uh, some of you would have heard the explanation of this perhaps in the past that in Arabia in the 7th century red camels were like a very rare commodity a very special commodity and maybe you've had some cool hip imams explaining that it's basically the equivalent of a red Mercedes so imagine if there was a fleet of red Mercedes waiting outside for you wouldn't you want to, wouldn't you want to take that prize? that's the prize, that's the reward that you get uh, if you are the means by which someone is guided to Islam. Okay, reason number three, everyone else is doing it. I need to clarify, this is gen generally speaking, to the kids, generally speaking, this is not a good reason to do anything. Okay, <laughs> generally speaking, you know what I mean? So you don't go home and tell your mom, hey, can I get an earring in my ear? And mom says, why? You say, everyone else is doing it, why can't I get an earring in my ear? But in this context, what I mean is, what I mean is, that other religious groups and other non-religious groups are doing street dawah. So here you have, probably you've seen Mormons before. Have you seen two very nice, clean-cut, clean-looking boys with white shirts? If you ever talk to them, they have little labels, name labels, and they'll say elder. Elder means like a sheikh. So they'll say elder Michael uh, and elder John. Most of the time, these are, these are people from the same one city in the same one state in the United States. Usually, they're from Salt Lake City in Utah in America. And they send their missionaries all over the world. All over the world. I was in Taiwan in Taipei. And I saw two young American boys dressed like this, riding on bicycles. And why are they there? They're there to do missionary activity. In other words, they're there, they're there to do dawah to call people to Mormonism, to their version of Christianity. <coughs> so if they can do it, why can't we do it? And the pictures, uh, I mean, it doesn't go brighter, I'm projecting. So this is Jehovah's Witnesses, on the left side is Jehovah's Witnesses. Nowadays, you'll see them all around the city. Okay, these are um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna guys doing their dawah. And uh, I think this is vegans. They're calling you to, to veganism, don't eat meat. Good luck with that. <laughs> Black Israelites. LGBTQ. LGBTQ, they want you to join the party. They want you to join the party, right? And there's some Muslims joining the party. There's some Muslims who are falling for this now. They're dancing at gay pride parades now, right? And are you ready for the last one? Ready for the last one? Yeah. You're gonna like the last one. Uh oh, so you can't read the shirts, yeah? But it says Muslims for loyalty. Muslims for loyalty, and they have an Australian flag on it. Any guesses? Does anyone want to guess? Australian Muslims. That's what you would hope. That's what I would hope. That's what I would hope. That's what I would hope. Australian Muslims on the street doing dawah, calling people to Allah. That's what you would hope. Oh, come on, Basim. But loyalty. <laughs> Muslims for loyalty. Muslims for loyalty. These are the good Muslims. These are good Muslims. The Qadianis. The Qadianis. Yes, yes. The cute boy in the front. <laughs> um, these are the Qadianis. So my brothers, what I'm saying to you is, if you, if you, don't, if you don't go out and do street dawah, guess what? These people will. Guess what? Yes, thank you, thank you, exactly. Right, so if we don't go out and do the da'wah and tell the people what Islam is about, 
they will be happy to do it for you. They will be happy to do it. They will go out and tell the people their version of Islam, which, as you know, is a little bit different from our version of Islam, right? They're going to talk, talk about Mirza Imam Muhammad being a prophet, being a Nabi. So if we disagree with that, why don't we go out? Why don't we make use of the freedom of speech that we have and do da'wah as well? Reason number four, uh, increase your knowledge, increase your confidence, and ability to speak to others. Go from being this uh, shy, scared boy who doesn't know how to uh, talk or how to answer people's questions to being the boss. <laughs> the boss. I hope that answers the question. Okay? But he must have started somewhere too. And by the way, I remember once reading uh, or hearing an interview of his in which he said that he had a stuttering problem. He had a stuttering problem. So he couldn't actually speak properly. But when he would go on the stage, when he would do da'wah, Allah, Allah would help him. Allah would help him. So inshallah, Allah, Allah will help you and me as well too, when we go in this path. Reason number five, I was just brainstorming. I was coming up with general ideas. I'm not teaching you anything. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to motivate you. I'm trying to motivate you to go out and do street da'wah. So reason number five is very simple, nice reason. You will make some great friends. You will make some great friends. And I made some great friends doing da'wah as well. Me and Zishan before we had a beer. Um, or our brother Naveed put it brother, uh, better, brotherhood, brotherhood, right? More than friends. You're strengthening uh, the brotherhood. And there's some great friends that I met through Street Dawah. I wouldn't have known Zishan if I wasn't involved in Street Dawah. I wouldn't have known Brother Basin if I wasn't involved in Street Dawah. We didn't meet in Street Dawah, but, yeah, long story, but had I not been involved in Street Dawah at one point, in London, UK, I wouldn't have joined an organization. And through that organization, I ended up meeting these brothers. You see? And, and these are brothers I met through, uh, that I met through Street Dawah. The brother with the uh, white turban, Naeem Imad, who joins us at uh, Dundas Square, Young and Dundas, every Sunday afternoon. Uh, so hey, these are some great friends. And, and it actually, it affected my whole life. <laughs> it, it, actually, it actually affected my whole life. I'll give you a very small example. I'll give you a very small example. Last weekend, I went camping with my son. I went camping because one of these brothers that I met in Sri Dawa, he told me about the camping trip. See what I mean? So you're making friends, you're making networks uh, of, of, of friends. The kind of friends that you need, not friends who are doing weed, not friends who are drinking. The kind of brothers, the kind of friends you need to be friends with. Reason number six, uh, you don't have to feel as constrained uh, by social or political correctness. Okay, so what I mean by that is, like when you're in the office, when you're at work, sometimes I know it can be uneasy, it can be difficult to, uh, to talk about certain subjects, right, at the workplace. So questions like, uh, do you believe in God? That, that's not something you're just going to throw at your coworker usually uh, around the coffee machine, right? Um, how much do you know about Islam? I mean, you, you can't just walk up to a stranger and say, how much do you know about Islam, can you, right? Um, do you follow any particular religion? Do you have any questions about Islam? But these are questions I ask complete strangers when I'm doing speed up. It's the only time you'll have this opportunity to ask so many direct questions about Islam and you don't have to talk about sports first, you don't have to talk about what was on TV, who won the game, the Raptors, you can just get directly to the point. Why? Because if I'm here, if I'm doing da'wah, and if there's a sign here that says free information on Islam, and if a non-Muslim comes here and takes a book, why is he here? He's not here to discuss sports, he's not here to discuss the weather. He's here specifically, or she's here specifically, for information on Islam. So now, no problem, now I can ask him, hey, do you know much about Islam? Do you have any questions about Islam? Anything based on what you heard in the media or what you read in the newspaper? So you can get right to the point. Where else other than street dawah will you have this opportunity to directly start uh, asking such questions and getting into the real conversations? So yeah, at, at the workplace, generally it's very difficult. And if you have a good friend at work, you might be able to start talking about these subjects, which you should. Uh, but you won't be able to uh, reach as many people as you can when you're doing street dialogue. Reason number seven, yes, it, it is effective. Because like one of the questions we often get from people is, but brother, is it effective? 
Does anybody uh, listen to you? Does anybody take the books from you? Uh, does anybody become Muslim because of this? So, so the answer is yes. The answer is yes. There are people who become Muslim. Yes, at at Dundas Square, at Young and Dundas, in front of the Eden Center, we have people who have said the Shahada and who have become Muslim. But the other question is, how do you define effectiveness, right? How do you define effectiveness? Is that your only standard? How many people became Muslim? So if I tell you, well, last Sunday, zero people, zero people became Muslim last Sunday when we did Dawah. Will you say that was a failure? That Dawah was a failure? I don't think that's the right way of looking at it. Because I think we have to be delivery oriented and not results oriented. We have to be delivery oriented. And even the Quran, even in the Quran, Allah tells the Prophet وسلم, that your job is just to convey the message. You're not a guardian, you're not a watch, uh, you're not a, um, some kind of uh, guardian over them. Your job is to just deliver the message. And we all know this story of Nabi Nuh, who for centuries he preached the message. How many people listened to him? So we wouldn't say Nabi Nuh who was a failure. No, we wouldn't say he was a success because he fulfilled the command of Allah. He did his job, right? So we have to be delivery oriented, not results oriented. If the results come, then Alhamdulillah. But the results are with Allah. And this street dawah is complementary to the do dawah through your akhlaq argument. Because maybe you've heard this before, perhaps. You might have heard. Uh, brothers, you don't have to do debates. Don't do debates. Don't do street dawah. Don't set up websites. You don't have to do any of these things. Just show good akhlaq to your non-Muslim neighbors. Just show good akhlaq to your non-Muslim neighbors and then they will want to become Muslim. So I'm not saying that argument is wrong. I'm saying that street dawah is complementary to, to this form of dawah, which you can also call the uh, samosa dawah argument. And do you understand samosa dawa argument? Because the, the, the idea for many of us is when it's Ramadan, cook some samosa, right? Fry some samosa, give them to your co-workers at work. And then maybe they'll all start saying the shahada, right? See, I can ask you the same question. How effective is that? This is shaitan who comes and tries to discourage us. This is shaitan who comes to us and says, well, brother, nobody became Muslim last Sunday. Why are you making this feel? I can ask everyone the same question. For years, maybe you've been giving dawah and you've been giving some, uh, sorry, you've been giving samosa and jalebi to your co-workers at work. I can ask you the same question. How many of them became Muslim because you gave them samosa? Hindus and Sikhs make samosa too, right? So start with samosa. Sheikh Ahmad Bida said, when the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christians come knocking on your door, invite them in, give them some samosa, give them some chai, but then you have to talk as well, right? You have to give them dawah as well. Are we scared to talk about Islam? Are we scared to talk about Tawheed? We shouldn't be scared to talk about these things. So start with the samosa, but don't end with the samosa, brother. Don't end with the samosa, right? If I invited you to a dawah for a dinner and I just gave you samosa and sent you home, I didn't give you the real meal. You're gonna be like, where's the biryani, man? Where's the chicken? Where's the, right? So, so give them those spiritual kebabs, right? Give them, give them the, the, the information, the knowledge about Islam as well, too. Again, I'm sorry the pictures, uh, the pictures are good man, it's the, the projector, you know. But I put some pictures up here just to show you because seeing is believing that. Look man, we do actually like talk to people all the time. These are photographs of us, which you can see on our Facebook page, Street Dawah Toronto. And uh, I mean, not a week goes by that we would just stand there and not talk to anybody. Like that, that never happens, right? When you stand there for two, three hours, even on the coldest of winter days, Minus 10, minus 15 degrees, someone will always come. Someone, especially at Yon and Dundas, you can imagine it's a very busy intersection. So someone will always come, we'll always have people to talk to, you know. This is a street festival that we did, you know. Which is another idea, by the way. I'm not only making the pitch for street dawa to you as individuals, I'm talking to the members of the masjid as well too. Like I'm talking to the members of the committee, I'm talking to the people here who are who run the masjid as well too, is support these kinds of initiatives. Between $300, $500, that's what it takes to rent a table for two or three days at these street festivals. Because in Ontario, in the summertime, they have street festivals every weekend. For $300, you know, $400, you can, you can rent a stall and bring your own table, bring pamphlets. But the masjid needs to support these initiatives as well too. Support the young people in your masjid who want to do street dawah. 
Don't discourage them. Encourage them to do this. Spider-Man. We give Spider-Man a book on Islam. How, how are you going to give him a samosa? How is he going to eat a samosa? He's got a mask on, right? So Spider-Man even, uh, and this proves Brother Nabi's point that like nobody is outside of the, the, uh, the, 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 the pale of, of Dawah, right? And this last picture is Brother Imad talking to, you can see, well, hopefully you can know, there's a lady, a blonde lady, she's got a cap on. She sings Shahada right there. She sings Shahada in that picture, right? So she became Muslim right there, Toronto, Young and Dundas. Oh, and if you think street dawah is not effective, do you guys recognize who, who that man selling the newspaper is? Yeah? Who's the man selling the newspapers? No, no. I'm not that old, man. I, no. All my photographs are colored. Even my baby photographs are colored. I'm not that old, yeah. Malcolm X. This is Malcolm X. You guys have heard of Malcolm X? Yeah. Okay. You've heard of Malcolm X. So Malcolm X, although he was part of, of a, uh, he was part of an organization that, that wasn't teaching true Islam originally, right? He was part of a group called the Nation of Islam. But how did they start? They started on the street. They started on the street like that, selling their organization's newspapers on the street. Um, and we don't have, we don't have that gift and charisma, perhaps that Malcolm X had. You know, I'm not, I'm not Malcolm X, but I'm just saying that. Look, when you have people working hard. He went from this, he started on the street, and he built up an organization this big. And fortunately for us, most of these people became Sunni Muslims in 1975. Fortunately for us, most of these people became regular Sunni Muslims in 1975. But where did he start? He started on the street. He started on the street. And let me try to motivate you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to use the guilt approach. I'm gonna try to use the guilt approach. Have you guys heard of Aira? Aira, I E R A. I E R A. Okay. Islamic, Islamic Education and Research Academy. Aira, okay. You've heard of Brother Hamza Tazortis? Hamza Tazortis is in that group. Adnan uh, Rashid is in that group. So this is a Dawa organization in the UK. This is a Dawa organization in the UK. Now, a few years ago, when they had the World Cup somewhere in uh, South America, do you remember where it was? Where is that? Brazil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in Brazil, when they had the World Cup, Aira sent a team of street dais to Brazil. They sent a team of street dais to Brazil who went on the streets and they gave out booklets and they gave out books in Spanish. Let me ask you a question. I'm not a geography expert. Just correct me here. But when you look at a world map, who is closer to Brazil? The UK or Canada? Canada? Canada. So whose job was it to take the Dawah to Brazil? That, brothers, that was our job, man. That was our job. We didn't do it. I'm being honest with you. It was our job. We didn't do it. The brothers from the UK did it, mashallah. They'll get the reward. They'll get the reward. Recently on IRA, have you been following it? They did Dawah somewhere in the Amazon rainforest. I don't know yeah. Malawi in Africa. So they're going to South America and they're doing Dawa. Aren't the American Muslims closer to South America than the British Muslims? Don't you think the American Muslims should have gone there first? Aren't the Canadian Muslims closer to South America? Shouldn't we have gone there? But we won't, we won't go to Young and Dundas. We won't go to Young and Dundas. We won't go to here, Ontario and Dundas. Brother Tishan has to email me and say, our team is short. We need more people. We don't have enough people. But these British Muslims, mashallah, they're going to South America and they're doing Dawa. That's the spirit. That's the spirit, you know. So, in a spirit of healthy competition, let's try to let's try to catch up. Let's try to catch up. Reason number eight. So this is another benefit of street dawah, by the way, is that your presence there will benefit other Muslims as well. Your presence there will benefit other Muslims as well. So, when we're at Yangan Dundas and we have a big sign that says "Free Information on Islam." There's Muslim tourists that come from Saudi Arabia. There's Muslim tourists that come from UAE, that come from India, that come from other countries. And right when they're in the middle of the dunya, right when they're in the middle of the dunya, at Young and Dundas, the busiest intersection in the busiest city in the country, and they see a big sign that says, free information on Islam, 
it makes them feel good. How do we know? Because they come to us and they say, Mashallah, Mashallah, Jazakallah khair for this work, right? So you will boost the morale of other Muslims as well. And it is a reminder to other Muslims. You know, two weeks ago, I'll be honest with you, two weeks ago I wasn't enjoying uh, the Sunday Dawah very much because it was too hot and it was just too much noise. I'm not trying to discourage you, but that particular day there was a drummer there, the music was too loud. After two, three, we weren't able to talk to people because there was so much noise. We were able to give out a lot of books, but we weren't able to talk to people because there was so much noise. And I was feeling a little bit, you know, demoralized. But right when we were packing up, a young Somali girl came. She wasn't wearing hijab. Young Somali girl came. She said, Jazakallah khair, brother, for doing this. I see you here every week, and it's a reminder to me. It's a reminder to me to stay connected to Islam. Because I kind of lost my way for a bit. I lost my way for a bit. So, if it wasn't so noisy, I could have talked to her. I would have told her that actually she encouraged me. She encouraged me by, by sharing that uh, comment. Uh, Muslim tourists, often you end up counseling Muslim youth, you know what I mean? Um, and I, I'm not trying to scare you because it doesn't mean you don't have to know a whole lot. Sometimes people just need someone to talk to. Because there's a lot of Muslim youth involved in a lot of problems and they're scared of going to the Imam in the masjid. Because they think the Imam is going to be very judgmental or harsh on them, which is not, hopefully, that's, that's, necessar that's not necessarily true. Or they're scared that the word will get around in the community, right? Um, so sometimes people are willing to talk to a complete stranger on the street. You'd be surprised. Most of you come up to us to complete strangers and they'll say anything. Like they'll say, brother, I've got a non-Muslim uh, girlfriend. Uh, what do I do? <laughs> right? um, or uh, I have a Muslim friend, he drinks alcohol. Uh, you know, how, how should I talk to him? So you end up giving a lot of advice or, you know, the leap to, to fellow Muslims as well too. So this is also, I think, how you judge success. It's not just how many non-Muslims took the Shahada and became Muslim, but how much good did you do? How much good did you spread? How much uh, positivity did you spread? And this is a response to that uh, excuse that some people will give. They'll say, don't do street dawah because we have to fix ourselves up first, brother. We have to fix ourselves first. I'm not perfect. Well, nobody's perfect. So if we wait until we're perfect, then we'll never do the work. And the other thing is, while you're doing da'wah, you are also in, you're also doing um, islah or self-correction as well too, right? You, 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 are, you are in a state of liquor. You're, you're not going to forget about Allah when you're standing there calling people to Islam. So it's a benefit on a personal level as well too. It's a benefit on a personal level as well too. Reason number nine is self-preservation. Self-preservation. This is a mosque in America, the Islamic Center of America, and you can see the graffiti on it. Go home, 9-11, you idol worship. Yeah. So, because another question people often ask me is that, well, when you do street dawah, don't you get harsh responses? Don't you ever get uh, belligerent or aggressive people or aggressive responses? So my response is, if we don't do street dawah, the situation is going to get worse. You understand what I'm saying? It's not going to get better if we hide inside in the home. It's going to get that much worse. Because now those misconceptions, those wrong stereotypes that people have about Islam, those are going to continue to spread. Because no one is really countering them, right? So if nothing else, just self-preservation. If you want Canada to continue to remain to be a safe society, for your wife, for your children, then then get involved and, and uh, you know get out there, you know. And again, how do you measure success? Because remember, Shaitan, whenever you try to do something good, Shaitan tries to discourage you. So Shaitan's always gonna come back to well, how many people became Muslim? Just because you went there, how many people became Muslim? That's not the only measure of success. If somebody comes with even one wrong misconception, even just one wrong misconception. Somebody comes and says, hey, is it true that you Muslims worship a black rock in Mecca? Is that true? Even if you can just remove that one stereotype, if you can say no, because that black rock was stolen once in, in, by, by some Ismaili group and the Hajj continued to happen. We continued to pray. We're not worshiping a stone. Hazrat Umar once said, 
to, he said, this is just a spoon. If I didn't see the Prophet kissing it, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have kissed it either. Um, so if you can convert a person's misconception into correct understanding, even if you can just clarify one uh, misconception or stereotype, that is success. That is success. You've converted them from an ignorant position to a position which is correct and which is based on knowledge. I'm almost done, by the way, I only have 11 reasons. I could come up with more, but you know, time is a, is a premium. Uh, so I mentioned this, uh, self-reformation, self-improvement, self-islah, right? Um, I mean, if you're there standing on the street, you have a dopey, you're doing Islamic dawah. Now, if, if, if somebody says something bad to you, or if somebody swears to you, hopefully, you're gonna remind yourself that, wait a minute, I'm representing Islam right now. I don't want to give him the finger back. <laughs> I don't want to swear back at him because what kind of image will I be representing for Islam? So you are kind of in a state of fasting and you are actually working on yourself as well too when you do that. And that is a response again to that, um, that rebuttal that some people give which is, well brother, I have to improve myself first. I don't want to do street dog because I have to improve myself. Well, you will improve yourself, inshallah. I I'm in a state of trying to improve myself. We're all in that same position, right? I'm no different than you, I'm just your brother, that's it. And reason number 11, uh, you will feel great. So I mean, in addition to everything Brother Naveed said, ultimately we're working for the Akhirah, right? Ultimately we're working for Jannah, for Allah's good pleasure. But in addition to that, this is part of Allah's mercy that when you do good things, you feel good. When we pray Salah, we don't just have to wait until we die to get the reward. We actually feel good when we pray. We actually feel good when we pray. When we give charity, when we give sadaqah, when we're nice to our parents, when we help an old lady cross the street, we feel good. We get a reward right here in the dunya. So when you do da'wah, honestly, you will feel really great. You will feel really great. Yeah? Sometimes you feel like this. Sometimes you feel like this. No? In the middle of winter? I can attest to that. Yes, yes. I've seen you skipping down the street. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you feel good. You feel good. So, brothers, I'll leave it at that. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask. This is my email. Uh, if you ever have any kinds of questions. And by the way, in addition to street dawah, I'm just saying that if you ever have any, like, uh, uh, non-Muslim friends and you feel that you're not able to uh, talk to them, then our team, I'm sure we can get somebody from our team to come out and meet your friend. Um, and and, and uh, just on my behalf, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to drive, come out, meet people at a Tim Hortons, sit down, talk about it. Because I have a passion for this kind of thing. I'm happy to do that. So please uh, take my email. And that includes the young students as well, too. Because sometimes at school, you know, you might get tough questions from your uh, fellow classmates. And please, um, if you could do it now, it would be good if you subscribe or if you like our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash street dawa Toronto. Yes. Yeah, school tour. Yeah. yeah, we do school tours at, at the mosque, at Badak Islamic Center as well. So if, 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 ever, if ever you have non Muslim friends um, uh, who live in our part of the, the woods, because, you know, Milton, this Marshall is a beautiful master, uh, but North York, Etobicoke, Toronto, uh, we'll be happy to host them at Islamic Islamic Center, show them around and so forth. By the way, on the way here, my wife told me that we now have 18,000 subscribers to our Facebook page. <laughs> it's hard to believe that. We have 18,000 subscribers to our Facebook page. So there's people in Indonesia now, mashallah, that are watching us. So, so we have to get it right, you know. Toronto, mashallah, we should be really happy to be here because it's a great city and Toronto is on the North American Muslim map. Toronto is on the North American Muslim map. So, so let's make it happen, man. We need energy, people of all ages. Brothers and sisters, by the way, I didn't mention, uh, because we have sisters at our Dawah table on Sunday at least. For our Sunday Dada uh, Square Dawah table, we have sisters as well too. Because when a lady comes, when a white lady comes and has a question about hijab, it's much more powerful when the answer comes from a sister. Like, you know, I could be the Grand Mufti of Canada, but my answer will not hold as much weight as sometimes when it's a sister in hijab, explaining why she wears hijab, why she's proud to wear hijab. Sometimes that's what people need to hear. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening. Can you actually, we're going to have, you're going to have to do this. Sorry.
Jazakallah Salah Bhai. So we are going to have a quick uh, Q&A session. So I will request Brother Nabi, Brother Salah and Brother Deshan to come over here and we'll get some questions. We'll try to finish it by, uh, you know what, 9.55 or second. And then we'll have two perfect more. Jazakallah here for listening everyone. Um, now we're going to have a QA and a discussion for um, 5 10 minutes or so, so uh, feel free to ask any questions, uh, any comments. Um, have we made our case for Street Dawah? Uh, so please, please. First question I'm going to ask. Uh, so about like, you know, there are, uh, there are a few. You know, when I was also involved in Street Dawah, and I was involved with this brother as well. Uh, sometimes you get a question and you don't have proper answer. Like, do you guys have kind of you know, like a set of questions that normally people ask and you can prepare yourself? Like, so you really you know, ask that. Because, uh, you know, somebody coming and you're not able to give the right answer, that's also kind of you know, a negative question. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, question. I think you already heard the question, which is like, okay, what if you don't have the answers to the questions? You feel you're not very knowledgeable. So number one, myself, I'm, I'm telling you the, the truth. I'm not being humble. I'm, I'm not very knowledgeable about Islam. But, but why am I doing street dawah then? I'm doing street dawah because it's the same set of questions that you get again and again and again. How many, do you think people are going to come up to you and ask about the, uh, the fiqh of zakat? The fake of uh, jewelry. Do you think people are going to come up and ask you about, well, what's the dalil in the Hanafi Mamba that uh, shrimp is uh, not allowed? Like, do, you, do you think normal Muslims are going to come up and ask these questions? No, they're going to come up and ask you the same questions again and again and again. Why do women have to cover up? Why do they have to wear their job? Uh, what's up with ISIS, Al Qaeda? If Islam is such a religion of peace, then how come Muslims are killing each other and bombing churches and doing all these things in Syria and Iraq? Um, and of course there's Christians as well. Christians will ask, well, you Muslims say that Jesus is a prophet and a prophet always speaks the truth. But Jesus in the Bible said that he's God. So why don't you believe Jesus is God? If you believe that Jesus speaks the truth and if Jesus said that he's God, why don't you believe that? So you, you get the same set of questions again and again and again. So you get used to answering these questions. You get used to answering these questions. And if somebody does ask a very difficult question, then there's no shame, there's no harm in saying, I don't have the answer for that question. I'm not a scholar, but if you're, if you're sincerely interested in the answer to that question, why don't you give me your email and I'll get in touch with you. Why don't you give me your email and I'll get in touch with you. I'll ask my imam, or I'll ask my friend who's more knowledgeable than me. Or maybe I'll ask Nabil uh, uh, or Brother Zishan. The other thing is, just like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons do, you know, we're not going out on our own. So when you're doing Dawah, it's not like you're alone there. You have two, three other brothers there, right? Um, so in other words, if you don't know the answer to the question, there will be other brothers that will be able to help you with the answer to the question. So it's not a big deal. Don't let that scare you. Zakhullah here for that. I just want to mention is that people also have a fear. People also have a fear that, oh, if I do street dial, I'm going to be barraged with all these questions. Actually, uh, I used to think like this as well, because I'm, compared to the uh, experts here on the panel, I'm fairly new to street dial. Uh, I've only done it for a total of five times, and it's been a, a, an amazing experience. And it shattered all those fears I had. I thought, oh, I'm going to be barraged with all those questions, I'm going to handle it. That's not the case. Uh, what, uh, it gives you an opportunity to basically talk about the purpose of life and conveys Islam in a very in a very free way, right? So um, you'll notice that you you're the one who's asking most of the questions and directing the conversation when you start doing this read dialogue. So you should put that fear out of your uh, out of your head. So much of that. Brother Dika, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to ask. Oh, sorry, uh, brother. Okay. Uh, I want to add actually to this. Uh, about, yeah, we will ask the question in Tana. 
Uh, I just want to let you know that there are so many people who are now working in GTA. Uh, not only doing street Dawa, they are actually training uh, the system. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Dawa Canada have uh, training, uh, Iva have training, and Isna Canada we have training, but the craft will be in the region some training for the head. Uh, the latest training that we have actually at Isna, it is on the same topic. One on questions and doubts about Isna. So if you want to join us, it's on the 15th of uh, September and the 20th of October. Both days are Sundays and training is from actually 2 p.m. to 6.30. It will be by Shia Prasamila. Whatever questions you have, you come and you ask Shia and we'll tell you how to handle those questions and how to answer those questions. And as Brother Sadat said, that on the street you are not alone, we are with friends, we are with other people. If you cannot answer, other, some, somebody else will help you. And if if you still cannot answer, I mean, there is no harm, you can say, okay, I will ask a share, I will give my email address, a phone number, I will find it up and let you know. There is no harm, and I believe me, there are no difficult questions. So, inshallah, you can join our training and rather probably uh, if there are any more training over here. Yes, sir. Uh, Hello,
you want to play what? Can you believe I gave Dawa to my senior manager? Like, it, it, it depends how you turn the conversation to a Dawa. It's not Dawa. He's a kind of Yeah, so I, I would acknowledge that it's a different dynamic in the office. So in the office, like I said, you won't start directly with these questions. Hey, what's the purpose of life? Do you believe in God? Do you follow a religion? We're not going to do that at work. On the, that's one of the benefits of street dialogue is you can just get right into it, right? But at work, just to, I, I mean, that's not really the topic, but it's related. So at work, you can indirectly trigger their curiosity. Indirectly trigger their curiosity. So when you're going to pray, you don't just have to hide it. You can actually tell your non-Muslim friend, tell your non-Muslim co-worker that um, I, I, I just have to go and pray and I'll join you later. Now, so eventually, his or her curiosity might be triggered that, or oh, are you Muslim? How often do you pray? Do you have to pray? Can't you just go home and pray? And that way it can become, uh, you know, the catalyst for a discussion. Uh, one really funny, uh, I mean, much I should say knowledgeable first, a very knowledgeable and funny brother on YouTube, uh, and uh, I would really recommend him, Kamal al maki Have you heard of Kamal al maki So look up Kamal al maki He's excellent and he'll give you lots of tips. In addition to the training that brother was talking about, one of the tips that he says is, for example, he says when he's on the bus, he just pretends to have phone conversations. You know? <laughs> he just pretends to talk to people. He said, "Yeah, I want to stop. Don't worry, brother. Just, just stay focused. Stay focused. Yeah, hey, this, this dunya, this world is, is, is nothing. We're all gonna die. We're all gonna die. You know how long can you live? No, exactly, exactly. Forty and fifty. We're all gonna die. The question is, where are we going after we die, brother? So stay focused on Allah. Stay focused. On. He, he's not talking to anybody. He's not talking to anybody. It's just an excuse to give dawah on the bus. So even at work, you know, I mean, you can do something like that too. <laughs> Just take one more question. One sister, then you can have a question. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I definitely want to pass this question on to Brother Navid. I just want to give my quick thoughts. question was, what are some of the protocols of care or caution we have to take in giving out Qur'ans, you know? Um, but very quickly, what I will say to that is that, number one, we don't just casually give out Qur'ans the way we give out the pamphlets or the short booklets. Because if the pamphlet gets discarded or recycled, that's a little bit different than the Qur'an. And the Qur'an is more expensive to print as well, too. Number two is, is it the Qur'an? That's a thick question. Is it the Qur'an? If it's just an English translation, and if there's not any Arabic in it, then does it qualify as Quran, right? Um, but still, care needs to be taken. So, I personally, I only give it when somebody asks for it. I only give it when somebody asks for it. Uh, otherwise, I'm just giving out pamphlets or booklets. And if they've asked for it, then I'm assuming they're serious and they're going to take care of it. And if they discard it, I, I don't feel that that was my responsibility because they asked me. It's no different than a friend at work asking you. Please give me a copy of the Quran so I can see what it is. Okay, before we close, uh, Brother Sadat does now have to uh, at Dandas in downtown Toronto every Sunday. And we have uh, another team with Brother Zishan uh, and Brother Nabi and Brother Faraz and Brother Zishan and We do an activity in Mississauga at the Golden Dining and Mandala every Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 1, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We will inshallah start in Milton as well. So the target is to start everywhere. So whatever is easier for you, please join. We have final teams. Give us your name and number. We will inform you about the Dalla training. We will inform you about our uh, our uh, Dawa timing, where we do, when we do, and uh, you can join our team. This step is actually the first step we have to take. The question is, do you start doing it right now? There is no excuse. If you cannot do it, you cannot speak, just stand beside one brother and see how he does that. You will inshallah get the word.